So we're very excited you're here with us. Some of you have done some pre-readings and will be receiving credit. You'll receive an email about that afterward. That'll be great. I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about Neil in just a moment. Please make sure that you have familiarized yourself with all the Zoom features down at the bottom. All right. Oh, good. We do want to let you know that we do periodically feature these live webinars. And the next one is going to be The Sword and the Shield, The Revolutionary Lives of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. That's going to be on March 31st at 7 o'clock. That's Peniel Joseph of the University of Texas. That's going to be very exciting. He's taking a, a new and really exciting look at Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. So we do hope you're able to join us. And we will we'll be having webinars after that as well. So just keep an eye. And if you enjoy this, please come again. National Council for History Education provides all sorts of professional development and materials for history educators, be they history professors, history teachers, or museum educators. Our most exciting event coming up very, very soon is our national conference. It's March 19th through 21st in Cleveland, Ohio. It is our 30th anniversary. We've got all kinds of exciting stuff happening. A big event at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, excursions, breakout sessions. You can see our wonderful keynote speakers, including Jill Lepore. It's gonna be a great event. Uh, we do hope some of you can come and be with us in Cleveland. If not, let's come to some webinars. All right, so we're so excited to have Neil Marr with us today. <clears throat> and Neil is a professor of history at the Federated History Department at the New Jersey Institute of Technology and Rutgers University at Newark, where he teaches American environmental and political history. He has published articles in academic journals, including social history, environmental history, and Western Historical Quarterly, and most recently, Modern American History. His most recent book, Apollo in the Age of Aquarius, published by Harvard University Press, examines the interrelationship between the space race and the grassroots political struggles of the 1960s era, including those involving the civil rights, anti-Vietnam War, environmental, feminist, counterculture, and conservative movement. The book was named a choice outstanding academic title in 2017 and a Bloomberg View must read book in 2017 and recently received the Eugene MMA Best, Aw Best Book Award. We are so delighted to have Neil with us and he is going to begin the presentation now. We're gonna hand the controls over to him. <coughs> Hi everybody, thanks so much. Um, I do have a cold so please apologize for any sniffles or coughs. Um, I think I need to share now, is that right? Um, yes, that's right. <laughs> no. Are we good? Yes. Great. Yeah, that's great. So I just want to thank uh, the National Council for History Education for inviting me to talk, especially Laura Wakefield and Grace uh, Leatherman. Um, it's been great working with them and getting this set up over the past couple of days. I also want to thank the Library of Congress and the U.S. Department of Education for helping to fund this program, which is, you know, just amazing to get um, historians from all over the country to speak to other teachers and get that conversation going really um, throughout the nation. And most of all, I want to thank all of you for tuning in to uh, hear me talk. Um, it's a great opportunity to, to talk about my work, but also to get some feedback from uh, people on the front lines who are doing the hard work of, of you know, teaching people about, about the past. Um, I am a professor of history at the Federated History Department of Rutgers University and the New Jersey Institute of Technology, where I teach um, environmental and political history <clears throat> of the United States. Uh, and what I want to do today is talk about uh, the, the relationship between the space race and the environmental movement. Uh, during the 1960s and the 1970s. And I wanna talk in particular about the role of visual culture, um, images um, in, in helping to launch that environmental movement and, and really the role of images in being central to that relationship between the space race and, and environmentalism. <coughs> I hope that our talk tonight will help us think a little bit differently about that, that environmental phrase, think globally, act locally. We'll come back to that a couple of times. Um, but the, the talk is sort of geared around um, that, that, that phrase as well. Much of, what, much of what I'm gonna talk about tonight comes from my book, uh, Apollo in the Age of Aquarius. And I wanted to begin by 
just briefly discussing that book because I think it will provide some context for the discussion of environmentalism, which we're going to do a little bit later. <coughs> Again, I want to apologize up front. I have a very bad cough. So my book was, oh, my clicker is not working. Let's see. I can't seem to forward my, my PowerPoint. Grace and Laura. Um, yeah, so um, you should find it down at the, at the bottom of the screen, I believe. Okay, so I'll just click on it, I see. Yep. Yeah, okay. did that work? Okay, yeah, it worked. <coughs> this, um, this book was very much sparked by my, my thinking about the summer of 1969. Um, which was obviously the, the summer of Apollo. In mid-July, about a million people traveled down to Cape Canaveral to celebrate really a, an important technological um, event in the nation's history. But a mere three weeks later, half a million young people hitchhiked, drove up to upstate New York, and uh, joined a celebration that was quite different. Uh, during that celebration, there was music at Woodstock that was often quite critical of the country. So my, my thinking about this summer was that, how did two events that seemed worlds apart culturally take place only three weeks apart? And that really led to the questions that sparked the book, but also the chapter, the, the talk that I'm gonna be giving tonight. And that question really was, how did the space race and the grassroots political and social movements of the 1960s and 1970s influence one another. To try to understand that, I organized the book around six grassroots movements and their relationships to the space race. Um, and this was done in five chapters. And I'll just go through these now quickly. I think that um, some of you have been given some readings from the book that cover other grassroots movements. Um, and maybe in the end, during the Q&A, uh, people could, you know, if they have questions about those other movements, I'd be really happy to, to talk about them as well. <coughs> so again, the book is about the Apollo program mostly, and, and chapter one really covers its relationship to the civil rights movement. It turns out that Martin Luther King and many civil rights activists were quite critical of the space race because they felt it was siphoning both financial capital, but also cultural capital and political capital away from more pressing problems, for instance, in what was then called the American Ghetto. Chapter two focuses on the Vietnam War. Um, Anti-war protesters were upset with NASA because NASA was actually developing hardware for the military in Vietnam. So they took to the streets to, to protest that. Chapter three focuses on environmentalism, and we're gonna be discussing that later tonight, so I won't go into too much detail there. I also wanted to look at the relationship between second wave feminism and the space race. And uh, women were quite upset that NASA maintained an all male astronaut corps, even though there was really no biological reason um, for that. Um, and that chapter also looks at how that, that cr criticism of the space race changed uh, feminism as well, second wave feminism. <clears throat> and then the last chapter of the book uh, combines a, a discussion of both the hippie counterculture and also the rise of the new right, the new conservatives, um, and how they battled um, culturally uh, in, during this period. And they used the Apollo program and NASA as a, a foil, as a, as a stage for that battle. Um, the hippie counterculture opposed to space exploration, thought it was a waste of money, and uh, the, the conservative movement very much embracing it. So what I end up arguing overall is that while during the 1960s, the space race, in a sense, helped to, to launch and foster these political movements. In the 1970s, opposition to NASA by all of these grassroots activists, in a sense, grounded the space race in problems back on Earth. And what I really mean by that is that <coughs> this activism by these grassroots movements they took to the streets, they, they staged protests. It really forced NASA to, in a sense, turn its technology around 
back on Earth to try to deal with some of these pressing problems on Earth, often by spinning off technologies, space technologies, to help people um, that were involved in these movements. And I'd be more than happy to talk about those other movements in the, in the Q&A. But what I want to do tonight is I want to focus on the environmental movement. And in doing that, I'm going to tell three stories. The first story involves how environmentalists were critical of NASA and the space race. I'll explain that opposition. The second story then shifts to how NASA responded to those environmental criticisms on a local level. And in that part of the talk, I really focus on Cape Canaveral, Florida, where a lot of you all um, are from, Florida. And then the third story focuses on how NASA responded to that criticism on a more global scale. And for that, I, I discuss um, NASA data and satellites and also those pictures, those photographs of Earth from space. All three of these stories at the center of them all are images. Story, the first story involves political cartoons. We're going to be looking at some of those. The second story, we're going to be looking at um, postcards from Cape Canaveral that NASA produced. And in the third story, we're going to look at those photographs of Earth from space. <coughs> My hope is that the talk will get all of us to think a little bit differently about environmentalism, the space race, and also the use of images in our teaching because I think they are a pretty incredible resource to get students motivated to think about the past. Regarding questions, I, I really hope uh, that many of you will, in a sense, virtually interrupt me by sending in questions during my talk, but I also have built into my talk um, places where I'll be asking questions and then looking at your questions on the, on the chat so we can have a, a discussion during my talk. I'd rather it be a conversation back and forth rather than just me up here, you know, doing it one way. So, any questions at this point? Not yet, Neil. I haven't seen None any yet. questions yet. All right. I did, I did want to, I did want to say that Neil mentioned it, but I did want to say that this is, this uh, webinar is funded by the Library of Congress and the Teaching with Primary Sources program. Many of you were with us in Florida for our Library of Congress Teaching with Primary Sources colloquium, <coughs> learned how to analyze primary sources related to the space race. So we're just very excited that we're able to provide this webinar. Thanks to the Library of Congress that supports that and, and that everyone else can enjoy as well. Thanks so much, Library. The Library of Congress supported my research for my book also, so they're doing great work. <clears throat> okay, story. <coughs> Number one, the environmental critique. Um, in the late 1960s, um, as the environmental movement, the young environmental movement began to emerge and grow, um, environmentalists became increasingly critical of the space race. And this is evident in political cartoons that began appearing um, in the late 1960s. And I'd like for us to look at two of these cartoons now. Um, and try to pick apart the critique. What are they really criticizing? And, and these cartoons are pretty straightforward, so it's not a, not a trick question or anything. Here are two. Uh, this is from the Minneapolis Tribune and also the Baltimore Sun from July of 1969. This was actually during the Apollo 11 mission. These were published. Um, and on the left, we see mankind's magnificent obsession. And on the right, we see Neil Armstrong looking back at planet Earth. Can we just sort of think about what we're seeing here and try to read these images as, as texts to try to make a, a, an argument about this environmental critique? If you were in my class, I'd be pointing to you and calling on you, but I have to do it virtually. Well, I can start the ball rolling here. Um, <clears throat> on the left, uh, we see the lower portion of the lunar landing module. When Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, it shows the impact of human actions on the left. Very good. Um, human actions in the sense that they, once the astronauts decided to leave the moon, 
they had to lighten their load and they left trash on the moon, exactly as someone is mentioning right now. Um, there was a reason for this, uh, leaving that trash up there lightened the load and that saved fuel, which made it easier to get back to Earth. So there was a practical reason for it. But the public learned of this and became quite upset that basically we were being lunar litter bugs. Um, here we see old spacesuits, cameras, and even perhaps the boot that Neil Armstrong used to take that first step on the moon. Um, on the right, we see a different sort of critique. Right, pollution. Someone out there is mentioning um, the footprint of pollution, which I think is quite poetic. Um, here we see Neil Armstrong looking back um, saying to Buzz Aldrin, quote, let's take a few more deep breaths, Buzz, before we leave. The idea here being not only is the moon being polluted by us, but our home planet, off in the distance, which we see as being shrouded in the word pollution, is also a problem, a problem close to home. Um, and and these, these critiques were becoming quite popular, not just among environmentalists, but among the populace at large through these political cartoons. <coughs> um, environmental scientists actually were also part of this critique. It wasn't just environmentalists. Um, they were critical because they felt that in its focus on getting men to the moon, the Apollo program was leaving no room for science and scientific experiments. They claimed that science was an afterthought for this project, and that was a problem and a mistake. And scientists began to uh, campaign for more science on Apollo in a, a quite famous publication called the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. Some of you might be familiar with this. It began uh, in the late 1940s and early 1950s as an attempt by scientists to communicate to the public about the dangers of nuclear weapons. And you can see on the front that, that doomsday clock, they called it, and the publication would change the, the countdown according to how, how, how dangerous the world was at that moment you know, with respect to nuclear war. Um, scientists took to the, the journal to lodge a, a campaign against NASA to try to convince it to um, include more science. Uh, biologist Alan Brown, as we see here, wrote, to date, NASA has devoted only a minor fraction of its resources to the pursuit of science. So basically, NASA was getting hammered um, from both environmentalists and environmental scientists. Now, this criticism had an impact on NASA's popular support. Here we see uh, a combination of Harris polls, um, and we can notice a dip around 1968. Now, part of that dip is due to um, that being the moment when Apollo 8 in 1968 orbited the moon in a trial run for the Apollo 11 mission. And that is when the world realized that we were in fact going to beat the Russians to the moon. And people then became less um, interested in, in the space race. But it also is the moment when environmentalists were most adamant in their critique against NASA, as well as civil rights activists, anti-war activists, feminists, and the hippie counterculture. Um, and this also caused this slight dip as well. And we can see this change of heart in none other than Senator Ted Kennedy. And we, can remember, we must remember that his brother John started the space race. Kennedy was a, Ted Kennedy was a very adamant proponent of space exploration until the, the late 1960s when he publicly announced, quote, a portion of NASA's budget should be redirected toward more pressing problems on Earth, such as pollution. <coughs> so just to recap story number one, it's a story about a, an emerging environmental movement becoming increasingly critical of the space race for polluting both the moon and the earth and for distracting us from cleaning up planet earth. And this criticism was expressed um, in popular culture, including political cartoons, and it led to a dip in popular support for NASA. 
any questions out there about story number one? We have to remember also that NASA is a publicly funded agency. So if NASA's popular support dips, its congressional funding might be threatened and it actually was. NASA's budget decreased by about 25% um, after 1968. Some of the participants were talking about how if the Apollo missions were to have begun in a different time period, uh, I wonder if it would have affected NASA's yeah. missions today and their focus today. And, and then Amanda asked, uh, why, you think, why do you think that people initially decided it was specifically NASA's responsibility to clean up the Earth? I, I think that um, many environmentalists didn't really think that NASA had to clean up the Earth, but they were concerned that a lot of the money and the public um, attention that was going towards the space race and the space program was taking attention and financial resources away from the pollution problem back on Earth. So I think it was less that they felt NASA should be cleaning up and more that they felt um, we all should not be trying to get to a dead rock, <laughs> which is the moon, and instead be redirecting some of those resources to clean up our air, water, and soil. Does that make sense? I think so. And yeah, some other folks wondering what would this be like without the context of the Cold War, so. That's a great question, and I'm gonna to get to that in just a minute, because the, the context of the Cold War is absolutely essential. Um, and it, it really shapes the way NASA initially presents itself to the public. And then um, we'll see how that, that, that public presentation shifts when in, with respect to this environmental critique. So let's, let's go in that direction. That's a great, great um, question. So story number two. <coughs> um, story number two. Uh, begins with my own research uh, down at, at Cape Canaveral, uh, at the Cape Canaveral Archive. Um, I was doing some research there down in 2008, and at a break in the research, I was walking through the gift shop, and I came across um, a DVD in the gift shop, and it was called Alligators and Rocket Ships. And because I'm an environmental historian, I thought that's a very interesting and strange <laughs> title. Uh, so I picked it up and bought it. And I wanna show a very brief clip from this video. And while you're watching, I'd like you to think about what is the message that NASA's trying to project in the opening of this video. Okay, so here we go. It's only about a minute long. Hello and welcome to Kennedy Space Center, NASA's home for launching humans into space. I'm John Coward, an engineer who works out here at the Space Center. What I want to talk to you a little bit today in this program is the wildlife here at Kennedy Space Center, and then we'll talk quite a bit about how we get shuttles ready to go fly and launch those humans into space. Another beautiful day here at Kennedy Space Center. Now the Space Center is located on a barrier island called Merritt Island. We have about 140,000 acres here on the Space Center, but we only use around 6,000 for processing all the flight hardware. So in 1963, we turned over the land we weren't actively using to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and they established the Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge and the Cape Canaveral National Seashore. So we have a lot of wildlife here on the Space Center. We have five active bald eagle nests located here. We also have about 300 manatees, which accounts for about 30% of all the manatees in Florida. And somewhere between four and 6,000 gators live here on the Space Center, which sometimes creates a problem, but not too often. So what you see here is this very high-tech stuff going on in the middle of a national wildlife refuge, and we're very proud of that. So before we talk about that, I just want to respond to a couple of the questions that I see here. Um, they talk about um, today's space race and the price and, and whether it's cheap or not. I'd love to talk about that in our Q&A because I think that there are some really interesting things going on with um, the, the new space race and, the, and, and between you know, organizations like SpaceX and, and Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin. So maybe in the Q&A, someone can remind us to come back to that. Um, the DVD. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Um, what, are we, what are they trying to project here? What is NASA trying to 
to to suggest to those people like myself walking through the the gift shop who might pick this DVD up. Pretty obvious, right? That they're they're basically they care about wildlife. Exactly. One of the comment, one of the panelists, one of the, the audience members said, um, "Yeah, although we were high tech, we're concerned about the environment." Exactly. What NASA is trying to say is that yes, we're high tech, but we're also environmental stewards. We're ecological stewards. <coughs> and I was pretty surprised at this message in the DVD because in the early 1960s, NASA was promoting something very, very different. Um, and that, that, that message that was quite different was also on sale at the Kennedy Space Center gift shop back in the 1960s. Let's take a look. Um, in my research, I um, found many, many postcards um, from different periods in, in the Kennedy Space Center's history. And at first I just started collecting them because I thought they were fun. Um, but then I realized that these were source materials. These were sources that could be analyzed and read for evidence. Um, and I began to collect them over a, a longer period of time and then began to think more critically about them. Um, and I wanna, I wanna just sort of have us for a second read these postcards. What, what is NASA trying to present or publicize in these postcards that might be a bit different than that DVD that we saw, right? Giving people some time to, to type. <coughs> I think what we see is, you know, um, right, we're all busy and high, it's high tech, right? We're busy and high tech. Um, yeah, the, 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 and a lot of concrete. Right, good. These people are picking up on it quite well. Um, the postcards really in the early 1960s are presenting um, NASA and the Apollo program as really a high-tech adventure, uh, really a high-tech um, um, moment in our, in our history, one that we can be extremely, extremely proud of. And this is where that Cold War context um, comes in. Someone had mentioned that before. Um, what's going on here is the, the context of the Cold War. In 1957, the Russians launched Sputnik, the first orbiting satellite, and it creates anxiety across the country, both among the public, <coughs> but also among scientists and politicians. The thinking was at the time that America had fallen far behind the Soviets in science and technology. We had an inferiority complex regarding science and technology during this time. And NASA, in its postcards and also um, in other uh, promotional materials, was trying to counter that, was trying to show that America was on its feet with respect to science and technology. So NASA did this through its postcards, but also through other promotional mechanisms um, down at Cape Canaveral. On the left, we see a tour book for um, one of the bus tours, early bus tours at the Kennedy Space Center. that basically took visitors past the technolog technological wonders of NASA. So people would tour the vehicle assembly building where the rockets were put together. They would tour mission control where the engineers tracked the rockets during liftoff. And then they would also be able to tour the launch pads themselves. On the lower right, we see the the old Kennedy Space Center uh, Visitor Center or Museum. It was filled with technology, again, promoting the technological milestones of our, of our program. And in the back, there was a rocket garden that you could actually tour. We see those rockets above the roof line of the museum in the background there. And on the upper right, we see a family in that rocket garden actually looking into um, a mock-up of the lunar lander. Um, so in the early 60s, mid 60s, NASA is very, yeah, TW, yeah, TWA, where someone's chatting that TWA used to operate the bus tours, right? Um, in these early years, the technology was forefront, but as the environmental critique began to grow, NASA began to be, NASA had to become concerned. 
because its popularity was dipping, its congressional funding was dipping. And we can trace that shift in attitude at NASA through one of its directors, George Lowe. Here's George Lowe. <coughs> he was the NASA administrator in 1970. And he was very much aware of this environmental critique. And he wrote, in the 1960s, the country was definitely looking outward and the national priorities included the Apollo goal because this would establish clearly in our minds and in the minds of the world, technological leadership by the United States. In other words, that was the era that included our response to Sputnik. He continued though, and the situation in the beginning of the 1970s is very different. The United States is now an introspective nation concerned with more with problems closer to home. Problems such as civil rights, um, gender inequality, uh, the Vietnam War, and in this case, environmentalism. And Lowe concludes that this is why anything we say about the environment or the quality of life or ecology has a great deal of appeal. So what Lowe is suggesting here <coughs> is that NASA should jump on the environmental movement bandwagon. At one point, um, NASA was considering rebranding itself in the 70s as an environmental agency, because everything they did, whether it was on Earth or in space, had to do with understanding our environment. So um, NASA begins to act locally to project this image of environmental stewardship. In the mid-1960s, um, NASA at the Kennedy Space Center takes much of the land around its launch pads, 140,000 acres of it, which it had been using as a buffer zone to keep people away from the launches, and it turns it over to uh, the federal government and uh, for the creation of the Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge. It becomes the second largest wildlife refuge in Florida, and then in the mid-1970s, NASA turns over 24 miles of coastline um, to create the Canaveral National Seashore um, um, to, uh, to also create this public land as well. Um, and I should say that it wasn't just that NASA was turning over land. It was also becoming environmentally um, aware and involved in the stewardship of this land. Um, on the wildlife refuge, NASA funded and participated in bird counts and bird banding. It helped reintroduce pelicans to the region and also protected those bald eagles nests that we heard about uh, in the DVD. It did that with the Audubon Society. At the National Seashore, NASA helped with fish counts. It helped tag baby sea turtles. It helped with manatee protection and also help to restore uh, the ecology of the dunes along this 25, 24 mile um, long coastline. Someone is writing in that they say that it's now a prime destination for bird watchers. And um, this is all you know, wonderful for the birds, but also really wonderful for NASA because they are presenting themselves, rightfully so, as um, an environmental steward in this, in this region. NASA also began to promote this work. Along with its tour of the technological wonders, NASA also initiated at Cape Kennedy a wildlife drive where people could drive through and see the ecological wonders of the Cape Canaveral region. And it initiated a host of ecological education programs for grammar school children and high school uh, children as well, um, right on the refuge. And again, they began to hawk this image at the Kennedy Space Center gift shop. Here are postcards um, from a later period, the 1970s. And um, I'd like us to just sort of compare these with the ones we saw earlier. Um, what's the, what's, what do we see that's similar? What do we see that's different here? More trees, exactly. Someone's writing in more trees. I think that's exactly right. The technology, someone else wrote green, Trees instead of concrete. Exactly. Great readings of these images. Um, it's important to note that the, the technology is still there. 
It's front and center, right? But as someone just wrote, um, it's intertwined with the natural environment. I see Florida nature here framing that technology, in a sense, bringing alligators and rocket ships together again. And this is part of um, a public publicity effort that is um, quite successful for NASA with respect to environmentalists. Um, one environmentalist who was uh, working with a group called Save Our Waterways in 1972 responded to this effort by NASA. He said, quote, we are impressed with the substantive measures that the Kennedy Space Center is taking to protect the environment as it proceeds with its mission to explore space. Um, so again, the, the roots of that alligator and rocket ship DVD from 2008 go back to this environmental moment um, in the 1970s. And someone's writing in, <coughs> postcards are a wonderful source to use with kids of all ages in the classroom. Someone else wrote agreed, and I, I couldn't agree more. Um, what I do in my classes with undergraduates is I actually bring in the postcards that you saw and I hand them out to my students and have them read those postcards um, and, and have them think of those postcards as source material. And it just brings it alive to them. Someone else wrote in, I like to have my children create their own postcards, a fantastic um, way to get students to think on a very personal level about the past. So before we move on to, to story three, any questions from story two? Okay, good. <coughs> I want to admit up front that story three is a, gets a little more complicated. <laughs> Um, someone wrote in, I'm not sure everyone has their comment setting to all panelists. Um, I'm hearing some, quote, some comments quoted, but they're not seeing them. So make sure you have your, your chats adjusted. Someone else wrote in, is this what leads to NASA to the idea of reusing parts after launches? I think that that was less an environmental decision and more of an economic decision. It was easier to reuse certain portions especially with regards to the shuttle, which was going to um, be launched many, many more times. It was economically um, more uh, efficient to do that than it was really a, an environmental issue. <clears throat> okay, sorry about my cold. Story number three begins with this man right here, uh, Stuart Brand. Stuart Brand was a hippie from the 1960s. He's sort of the Forrest Gump of the counterculture. He pops up over and over again everywhere. He's an amazing person, um, still alive. Um, and this story begins in February of 1966 when he is out in San Francisco. He's in the North, North Beach neighborhood. Uh, on a cold February day, he climbs up onto his rooftop in North Beach takes uh, 100 microdoses of LSD, <clears throat> puts it on his tongue, and takes in the, the view of San Francisco out in front of him. He's on that rooftop looking out, spending the day up there, basically hallucinating. Um, and he claimed when he was up there that he could actually see the curvature of the earth, that when he looked out from his rooftop, he could see the earth curve. And it made him realize that the earth was finite, not infinite. And <laughs> someone wrote, I'm sure he could, it's true. Um, he wondered how he could get that perspective and that revelation. How could he communicate that to other people? And he decided that a photograph of the earth from space would do the trick. It would have the same effect on people. As he put it, such a photograph would mean that the earth was complete, tiny, adrift, and no one would ever perceive things the same way. What he did was the next day when he came down from the rooftop and from his trip, uh, he went to a local printing shop and had hundreds of buttons <coughs> printed with a very simple question. Why haven't we seen a photograph 
of the whole earth yet. He then went over to Berkeley across the bay and began selling them for 25 cents a piece. He sold them at Stanford. He mailed them to members of Congress, to NASA administrators, and even to Russian scientists who were working on the Russian space program. Um, and soon these pins were seen on lapels um, at NASA headquarters. Um, <laughs> someone wrote, so essentially LSD inspired all of this. Well, uh, history is strange. <laughs> As a result of uh, Stuart Brand's efforts, um, somewhat a result of his efforts, images like this uh, began to be produced. Uh, Earthrise was taken in 1968 um, from Apollo 8. And then four years later, we have the very famous whole Earth image taken in 1972. I want to emphasize that the second image, whole Earth, was actually taken because NASA administrators intentionally changed the trajectory of Apollo 17 so they could capture this image specifically because they felt it was an important image as Stuart Brand had said. Stuart Brand later claimed that this is what helped spawn the environmental movement. And I wanna to listen to a brief um, audio of Stuart Brand discussing these images and his role in it, because I think it's really telling. It's just about a minute long. When the Apollo space program came along in the 60s, a lot of my fellow environmentalists were kind of against it for various weirdly technical reasons. And all I saw was big adventure, let's get on with it. And so as a result of that, I was on board in the space and pushed, why haven't we seen the photograph of the whole Earth yet in 1966? And, and we got the photograph and that created the environmental movement out of almost nothing. I was sort of acting as if I was lobbying NASA to get images of the Earth from space, but I was really lobbying the populace of the world <laughs> to pay attention to the image and to think about the image a little bit in advance so that when we got it, uh, there would be that shock of recognition. We have this big new mirror to think about ourselves in regard to, and also to think about it as a finite, fragile looking um, place that we live. And I was pretty sure that that set of things would occur when we had the photograph. Um, Amazingly enough, they did occur, and that photograph became so iconic that it replaced the previous iconic image of the Earth, which was the mushroom cloud of uh, the Cold War. So you got rid of a bad image and, and got a very positive image that was still with us. Now, I, I really admire Stuart Brand. He's done other, um, other things that are equally as interesting, um, but his story just doesn't totally add up um, for two reasons. And I want to sort of go into these reasons in a little bit of detail. First of all, there were already many images of the Earth from space. Here we see an image taken from the ATS satellite, NASA's ATS satellite. It was taken in 1967. And Stuart Brand knew about this image because he actually put it on the back cover of his whole Earth catalog. Um, and if if you are not familiar with the Whole Earth Catalog, it's an amazing history. It was basically a Sears Roebuck catalog for hippies. Um, uh, so it's worth taking a look at and also even using as a primary source because it's really quite, quite fascinating. So Stuart Brand knew about these images. He was actually using these images. And NASA was very much aware of these images and promoting them to the public as well. Here's the Washington Post from 1968 with an image of the Earth from space on its cover. <clears throat> that same year, a paper from uh, Spokane, Washington, included an image of the Earth from space along with its reporting and images of a debutante ball um, in, uh, in Spokane in December of 1968. And I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this item here, but this is a, a Viewmaster 3D. They came out with images of the Earth from space in the late 1960s, before NASA took the whole Earth image. So the public in the 1960s, it was very, very difficult for the public to avoid images of the Earth from space 
uh, during this time. Now, the second reason that I think um, Stuart Brand's story is a little bit flawed is because in the beginning, the original meaning of these images, the original meaning of Earthrise was not linked to environmentalism. <clears throat> this image we see here, Earthrise, was taken on Christmas Eve, or it was, it was beamed back to Earth on Christmas Eve, <coughs> 1968, when Apollo 8 was circling the moon. The astronauts spoke to the world on Christmas Eve and read from the book of Genesis while this image was beamed back to Earth. The next day, the Pulitzer Prize-winning poet Archibald McClesh wrote a short essay called Riders on the Earth. And that essay appeared in the New York Times and immediately went viral throughout the globe in newspapers all across the world. In that short essay, he wrote, to see the earth as it truly is, small and blue and beautiful in that eternal silence where it floats, is to see ourselves as riders on the earth together, brothers on that bright loveliness in the eternal cold, brothers who know they are truly brothers. So in the beginning, these images did not mean environmental stewardship. They meant global unity. And this becomes evident again two years later during the first Earth Day of 1970, when the iconography of that day is almost void of images of Earth from space. Instead, pollution is what ruled the day on that, that, that celebration of Earth. We see images of dying trees, images of smog in the nation's capital, uh, images of pollution postered on t-shirts, flyers, and here on posters. In fact, in my own research, I've, I've seen that it wasn't really until Earth Day 1990 when that image of Earth from space becomes central to the environmental movement. So this begs the question, how did Earth photographs become green? <coughs> the answer is NASA technology, specifically NASA satellites. In 1971, NASA held a conference on remote sensing from space. That means using satellites to gather data from space about the Earth. And the report from that conference called Remote Measurements of Pollution argued that satellites in space, if developed properly, could provide essential data regarding pollution that cannot be obtained by any other means. NASA responds to this call to arms by taking its weather satellite, which at the time was Nimbus, by taking the seventh Nimbus satellite and retrofitting it to be what it called its pollution patrol satellite. They launched it in 1978 and it measured atmospheric pollution globally. Here we see its trajectory across the globe. It did this every six days. This was the first truly global data set ever collected. <coughs> Um, and it is this global data that transformed photos like Whole Earth into environmental icons. And I'll illustrate that with two examples. The first example is from the ozone crisis. <coughs> Beginning in the early 1960s, um, a British team began measuring ozone in the Antarctic. They measured it from the 60s through the mid-1980s, and they found, as we see in this graph, a decrease in ozone during that period. They published their findings in Nature Magazine. This is the graph from Nature Magazine. But when they did publish it, few people beyond the scientific community took notice. However, scientists at NASA very much took notice and were very alarmed because their Nimbus satellite had missed this data. It was calibrated too finely to understand and capture this data. 
So the NASA scientists and engineers went back and recalibrated the Nimbus 7 satellite. And then six months later, used that satellite to make this British Antarctic discovery, which was local, a global discovery. And they took three steps to do that. First, they used the Nimbus 7 satellite to collect worldwide data on ozone depletion. Second, they used computer models to smooth that data, to make it readable. What they did was they connected points of equal value with contour lines and assigned false colors to certain value ranges. And then step three, and this is very, very important, they took that global data and placed it on top of images that look like whole Earth. The result is an image that's not only familiar, because we are familiar with whole Earth and Earthrise, but also an image that is more readable, more understandable, and more alarming to the general public. So what they did was um, they also published this image in the New York Times six months later. And whereas few media outlets had reported on the British team's graph that we see here in Nature magazine, regarding ozone depletion. Six months later, after the New York Times article, um, the story hit the front pages and this was now being reconsidered an ozone hole. So from ozone depletion to an ozone hole. In a sense, the NASA's global data had made this into a global environmental crisis. Um, the second exp uh, example I want to give very, very briefly is just regarding um, climate change. Climate change also began locally. Um, Charles Keeling studied um, CO2, measured it in Hawaii from his observatory beginning in 1958 and continued measuring it up through 2015. His Keeling curve became famous in Al Gore's An Inconvenient Truth documentary. But again, it hadn't become popular during Keeling's uh, you know, measurements during that time until Al Gore's um, uh, documentary. Although Jim Hansen, a NASA scientist, took that data, corroborated it globally with satellite technology, and then re repositioned that data um, into images such as this, a red earth on fire, uh, with the different data um, correlating to the, 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 the colors on this, this image. Um, so again, we went from a, a, a rising CO2 to this crisis, crisis of global warming. So just to wrap this up, um, as my talk has hopefully illustrated, the relationship between the space race and environmentalism is a complicated one. During the mid-1960s, when the environmental movement began criticizing NASA's space technology for littering the moon, fouling the air and water at Cape Canaveral, and for distracting Americans from the increasingly severe pollution problem plaguing the planet, the space agency responded by acting more locally. This entailed protecting and preserving the wildlife and wild lands of the Kennedy Space Center. Yet while the environmental movement was influencing the space race, NASA was also transforming the movement by helping environmental scientists think more globally about nature on planet Earth. Such efforts entailed developing new space technologies such as satellites and computer models that could monitor air and water pollution across the entire planet. Visual culture, from political cartoons to postcards to photographs, were not only central to this history, but can also help students understand and become excited about this history. Um, this visual culture can also illustrate a very new meaning to the popular environmental slogan, think globally, act locally. Thanks very much, and I welcome any and all questions. I'd be happy to talk about the environmental movement or any of the other movements that might be of interest to you, or even about the contemporary space uh, program, um, which I think is both exciting, but also a little bit, um, a little bit concerning. <clears throat> so one question is, where do I see NASA going forward with regards to environmentalism?
Um, I think that NASA is without doubt the most important environmental organization on the planet. Um, they are collecting more data than any other organization. Um, and they are completely dedicated to uh, dispensing that data at no cost to the world's scientists. So I think that it's uh, uh, an incredible um, effort that NASA has made. Um, thank you all too. Just one last uh, comment about the, the current space program, the current space, you know, privatization of the current space program. Um, there are a lot of efficiencies that can be gained through the privatization of, of space exploration. Uh, for instance, uh, SpaceX is putting payloads into space at a fraction of the cost that NASA did um, in the 1960s and 1970s, if you account for inflation. But by putting it into private hands, by making our space program private, we as, as a civic culture do lose something. We, we lose the ability to critique that space effort. So whereas in the 1960s, scientists could um, write editorials in the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists and put pressure on NASA to include more science on its <coughs> missions, I'm not sure that companies like SpaceX will be forced to respond in the same way to such pressure. So by privatizing space race, the space race, we're basically taking it out of our civic culture. And I think that's something we need to think about. There's a question about, did the civil rights movement and feminist movements encourage the hiring of more women and blacks at NASA? Absolutely. Um, the, the feminist movement in particular, their main fight was for uh, the, the entrance, the ability of females to apply to the astronaut corps. Um, the National Organization for Women um, led a multi-year campaign to try to break that ultimate glass ceiling at NASA. Um, they held uh, rallies and um, protests all over the country. Um, they also used um, medical science to, to make their case. Um, there were women who had been examined by the same doctor who examined the Mercury 7 astronauts. And what he found was that medically there was no reason that women could not travel into space. And in fact, biologically, in several instances, they were better prepared for space travel than men. Um, so that forced NASA to open up its, its astronaut corps to women. And civil rights leaders were more interested in not so much hiring African Americans at NASA, although that, that was a concern, but more about using some of the technologies that NASA had and the resources NASA had to help people living in urban areas, poor African Americans living in urban areas. And I talk about that, that spin-off technology um, in my book. There's, there's two other questions. The first one is, what do you think of the controversial SpaceX tiny satellites being launched at the risk of dark skies? Yeah, I have a colleague who's writing about light pollution <coughs> um, and it's a, it's a huge concern in her work. Um, I don't know enough about it, but again, I think it does speak to this issue of the privatization of, of, of space science and space exploration. Um, I'm not, I, you know, I'm not sure that SpaceX will have the same pressures put upon it to do the right thing. Um, you know, Elon Musk is is launching a Tesla red convertible into space as a promotional, you know, sort of gimmick. Um, is that what we are looking towards, the, the branding of every launch out there? There seems there has to be some middle ground where we can capture the efficiencies of privatization while still giving us a public say in shaping our space program. A middle ground seems to be the way to go. And O'Neill has two questions. The first one is, do you see the federal government stepping in to regulate new space programs to apply stricter standards in light of the socio-political wave of environmental conservation. And then I'll, I'll let you answer that before you, <laughs> you can maybe read the other one. I, um, I, I don't see the federal government forcing NASA to become more environmentally engaged. Um, 
but I, I do think that there are, there are huge contingencies within NASA who are already on that page. You know, NASA is a very diverse organization of engineers, astronauts, scientists, and there's a huge contingent within that organization that believes that that mission, that environmental mission is the central component of that organization. So I'm less worried about the federal government pushing NASA and, and more worried about um, the federal government not funding NASA because they believe that privatization is the, the only way to go. And then he also asked about if you happen to know Martin Luther King's stance on African Americans in the NASA program, given his outspoken stance against NASA funding. Right. Um, he was a, a proponent of African Americans in, um, the, in, in the astronaut corps. But there's a great quote from Martin Luther King um, after the riots in the Watts neighborhood of Los Angeles. Um, he went to Congress and was asked to testify about those riots. And he said, it's so ironic if people came to this planet and saw people in outer space looking back at telescopes on Watts and watching the riots there and wondering why is all this money being spent on outer space when we have these problems back at home. So for him, I think it was less an issue of you know, getting African Americans into the astronaut corps, and more a, a problem with the actual entire systemic um, culture of racism that was uh, taking all these resources away from problems back on Earth, problems in the American ghetto, and siphoning them off to put um, some some uh, white men on the moon. Uh, you know, a great a great primary source for you to use with your students is Whitey on the Moon by Gil Scott Heron. He's a, uh, a public, um, he's, a, he's a musician, but a, really a spoken word artist. And he has a great, great um, song called Whitey on the Moon. You can get it online. And it just talks about this issue of all this money being spent on the space race when his sister, for instance, in the song is, is having trouble in the, the urban ghetto. I, I encourage you all to use it. It's a great source. And Chris wanted to know if um, uh, what your thoughts were on the change to natural gas for launches. I don't know enough about that. I'm sorry. Yeah. I know that there was a huge controversy back in the 60s about the, um, the, the pollution that the launches were, were causing in, in the Cape Canaveral region. Um, and there was a lot of concern during the space shuttle region about the re uh, period about that as well. But I'm not sure about the most recent switch. couple more. We, we, I'm happy to keep this up for a few more yeah, minutes. Please. I know some of you probably uh, have to head off. Um, if, you, if you are heading off right now, do make sure you take the survey that Laura put in the chat window. Um, and if you have a few more questions, we can stay for a few more minutes. We're glad that everyone's engaged and excited. I also want to mention that, you know, NASA headquarters has a great um, photography collection. Um, they also have clippings files with a lot of these cartoons and they're all publicly accessible. So you, know, you can very easily, you know, go to those um, online archives and get sources for, um, for your students. What I often do is I get 10, 15 cartoons, political cartoons, different ones, and I hand them out to my students and I have them work in groups to try to come up with an argument about what that cartoon is trying to say. Um, and I, I get cartoons about feminism, civil rights, Vietnam, all related to the space race. And it's a fantastic in-class exercise for me. Uh, does NASA have a set part of their budget dedicated to environmental conservation? That's a great question. Um, I, I know that back in the 60s and 70s, <coughs> Um, it was more money dedicated to specific uh, technologies and programs that were environmental rather than an actual department. But that might have changed. I know, for instance, that the Goddard, um, I mean, the, um, where Jim Hansen works, uh, Goddard in New York City, um, basically their entire uh, budget is dedicated, a large portion of it is dedicated to studying climate change. Um, so they have that covered there. And very interesting, the Goddard Space Center in New York is in the same building 
um, that the diner from Seinfeld is in. So when you see that diner in Seinfeld, just think that up above it, some of the most important scientific research in the world's going on. <laughs> um, and Laura asked if, um, he says we're only talking about the people being sent to the moon, but were the satellites as controversial? The satellites that were being, um, no, as my, the satellites are more controversial now because um, there are thousands and thousands of satellites in space um, that can fall back down to earth and will fall back down to earth. So people are worried about what they call space junk, that that junk is not only polluting outer space, but is falling back down onto the earth. And um, this was most uh, prevalent with the Skylab, you know, fiasco in the eighties when it fell back down and landed in Australia. Um, so it's a more of a contemporary concern than it was back in the, in the 60s and 70s. It's a great question. What are they doing to deal with space junk? Um, there are laws being developed. Um, I have a colleague whose entire dissertation is on space junk. Um, so if you want me to get you in touch with her, let me know, and I would be happy to pass on that information. And I think, um, I think you mentioned earlier about the, the, the light pollution, but um, Laura asked about what happens to the animals when launches occur at night, they're quite bright. Yeah. Um, they're disturbed. What NASA tries to do, they're, I've read that they try to um, set off alarms before the flight to scare a lot of the animals away out of the area before the launch so they don't get, get hurt. Um, but it, it's, it, you know, it's obviously disruptive um, to the animals there. Um, you know, one would hope that maybe they become accustomed to the alarms and then leave the area. I don't know. Yeah. It looks like, like um, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, Michelle would be, would be very interested to be referred to your colleague. Great. Um, so perhaps um, you could send that name, to us and we'll get sure. that to Michelle. Her name is Lisa Ruth Rand, R-A-N-D. And she is now, if you, if you put in Lisa Ruth Rand, histo environmental historian, space junk, you will find her stuff. And I will also pass on links to her, um, to you all to post. Also, there's a, another colleague, um, Sarah Pritchard, P-R-I-C-H-A-R-T-A-R-D, at Cornell, um, who is writing now about light pollution. Um, and some of that has to do with satellite light pollution. You can find her work also as well. She wrote a great article in Environmental History about light pollution from satellites. There you go, right? And also, um, I'll, I'll give my email address and you can contact, people can contact me if you have questions about primary sources and those sorts of things. I'd be happy to share what I have. Thank you, that's wonderful. Sure. And again, I hope, I hope you can see the screen that I'm sharing, but um, again, do make sure you respond to the survey and we will be sending you an email tomorrow. You'll, you should get it 24 hours from now, so don't panic till then. Um, but you will get an email verifying that you've attended three hours of professional development. But we're... Well, I wanna thank everyone. Thank you all for not only tuning in, but being incredibly engaged throughout the yes. talk. It was really great to see the, the chat just moving along and I really appreciate your questions and your interest in, in these sorts of issues and keep doing the good frontline work of teaching those students because they then come to me, <laughs> a lot of them. And, it, uh, and also those of you who are just interested in history, you know, keep being interested and keep passing that on to people. It's important. And Neil, thank you for being with us. This is sure, really, you. really exciting and it's such a treat for, for teachers to get to really dive deep into history like this and and for everybody else out there too i know you're not all teachers right. so it's just a great treat for all of us thank you everybody it was great for me too